Good morning and welcome. My name is Tim Poe. I'm Director of Telehealth with the UNC Cancer Network. Thank you so much for being here today, March 18th, 2019, for our Community College Oncology Lecture. This is part of the North Carolina Community College System Lecture Series. And just a few things to go over before we really get started. Um, wanted to let you know that uh, there are that if you're having any technical problems at all, especially with the audio, call us 919-445-1000. We do have people standing by who can assist with that. There are lots of places you can find out about this lecture and lots of other lectures in our different series, and that's unccn.org. UNCCN.org. You can find uh, all of our previous community college lectures, our professional lectures, our community lectures, and then you can find out information about upcoming lectures as well. So, uh, you can also find us, uh, you can contact us by email at unccn at unc.edu. We're on uh, Instagram, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on YouTube, so uh, wherever you prefer to get information, uh, find us there. All right, we're going to use Poll Everywhere, and I want to encourage everyone watching today to please go ahead and uh, use this. It really makes the lecture interesting. It makes it uh, interactive. So uh, there are two ways that you can join us with Poll Everywhere, and this is completely anonymous. So one way is to just go to any web browser, whether that's in a smartphone or a tablet or a laptop, and you'll just go to Poll Ev, P O L L E V dot com forward slash unccn so pollab.com forward slash unccn you'll go there you'll see the questions as they appear on the screen here as well you can go ahead and answer those uh, take your best shot at those and then see uh, from the, from your presentation here both your results and others results again it's all anonymous and it's a great way to interact with our presenter during the lecture if you prefer to join uh, via text, that's another way that you can join us for Poll Everywhere. And you'll put in uh, the, the number 22333, and there in the message field, you'll type in UNCCN. Do that one time. You'll get a message back. It will say you have joined, and then you can just answer the letters that correspond to the uh, answers to the questions. And then you'll be able to share your questions right at the very end. We really, in addition to uh, Poll Everywhere, we love it when we can get feedback from you. This really helps us to make uh, every lecture better and to uh, get feedback to both us for the program and to our presenter. So unccn.org forward slash eval at the end of the presentation. Please go ahead and fill out a survey. These really help us. All right. So our Poll Everywhere question, gastrointestinal GI malignancies refers to cancers of the gastrointestinal tract and accessory organs of digestion. So if you believe that that statement is true, you'll put in an A in just a moment. If you think it's false, you'll put in a B. Uh, that's kind of a softball question there, hopefully. But take your best shot at it, and then we'll look at the answer in a moment. So we have our guest here sitting next to me. So uh, Julie Harris, welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks for having me, Tim. Absolutely. So let's see a little bit about you. Julie uh, Tarheel, born and bred, graduated from UNC with both her undergraduate and graduate degrees, began her nursing career as a bedside nurse in the surgery trauma ICU at UNC, where she fell in love with the care of critically ill surgical patients. Got it right so far? So far. All right. After completing graduate school, she transitioned into her role as a nurse practitioner with the Division of Surgical Oncology at UNC. Here she works with patients throughout their inpatient perioperative oncology experience, and that includes preoperative optimization, postoperative care, discharge planning, and postoperative education. That's right. So tell us a little bit about what, what your career trajectory looked like. And to, to so many of the students who are in uh, different different healthcare related careers, what you know, what what did your what did your plan look like? So I think you know we've all all known patients, mm -hmm. people who have mm -hmm. been touched by cancer, and my aunt was was one of them. Um, and very early on, when I was in high school, she kept talking to me about how great her nurses were and how much she mm -hmm. loved her nursing staff and how much that helped her cope with her her illness and her disease. Um, and greatly encouraged me to think about things in the medical field. So I did. Um, that's why I went into nursing in the first place um, and just fell in love with being able to care for patients at such an opportune time. Um, 
like the like your introduction shared, you know, I'd spent most of my bedside career in the surgery trauma ICU, which was not specifically with cancer patients, right. but surgical patients and trauma patients in in particular. Um, and from there, you know, as I graduated from um, nurse practitioner school, my graduate degree decided I wanted to focus my care on care of surgical patients with cancer to kind of mesh those two um, loves, if you will, Great. desires. Great. So that's that's how I ended up here. Great. Well, thank you so much. A reminder to our audience that you will have an opportunity to ask our guests questions at the end, so be jotting those down, and then please share us share those with uh, with our presenter at the end of this presentation. So, all right, uh, let's. If if you uh, would take a moment to put in your answer, and I see the answers are already showing up. So, uh, we'll we'll take about 10, 15 more seconds, and if you would go ahead and put in your answer there. Again, gastrointestinal malignancies refers to cancers of the gastrointestinal tract and accessory organs of digestion. True A, false B. How are they doing? 100%. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, so with that, GI malignancies, uh, Julie Harris, FNP, MSN, and I'll pass the controls over to you. All right. Thank you, Tim. All right, so this is kind of a broad topic, but we'll, we'll do the best we can kind of covering all points of this. Um, first off, I would just like to define cancer. You know, the, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network um, is, is a large group that does a lot of, or all of the guidelines, um, using most up-to-date research and data that we have to create guidelines for care of our patients, and they define cancer as a disease of cells that have an abnormal life cycle and grow or spread into other tissue. Um, so just keep that in mind as we go through this entire lecture. Um, why is this important to us? Cancer is the second leading cause of death in the United States. It's only second to um, cardiovascular um, disease. As an overview for GI malignancies, as Tim just shared in that poll question, um, GI malignancies include cancers of the esophagus, the stomach, the liver, the biliary tract, gallbladder, pancreas, small bowel, colon, rectum, and anus. Um, it impacts our country greatly. Um, in the United States in 2019, so this year, um, it is estimated that 1,762,450 new diagnoses of cancer um, for all, all cancer will be diagnosed. Um, 606,880 um, patients will die of cancer this year. Of the digestive system, alone, um, and you can kind of see the breakdown at the bottom of this slide, 328,000 patients will be diagnosed with malignancy of, of the GI tract, 165,000 of them will die. If you do the math, that means that 18.6% of all new cancer diagnoses in the U.S. in 2019 will be cancers of the GI tract. Over 27% of the cancer-related deaths that are anticipated in 2019 will be from GI malignancies. Um, here's another uh, picture that just kind of breaks it down into sexes. The last chart did as well, but this one is a little bit better visual. Um, colon and rectal cancers are number three for an incidence, so estimated new cases. Um, it's the third leading cause of cancer for both men and women in the U.S. Um, and you'll also notice that pancreas falls on, on both of the top 10 lists for males and females. The second half of this chart, which you'll see, is the estimated deaths in 2019, broken down by sex, um, and I've highlighted the GI malignancies in particular. The big point that I want to drive home with this is that cancer of the GI tract is quite lethal um, and tends to be a little bit more aggressive than many of the other cancers that we see. All right, so here we have another poll everywhere question. Um, which of the following statements about GI malignancies is true? They include cancers of the liver, pancreas, and brain. If you think that that's the correct answer, select A. 47% of cancer-related deaths are from GI malignancies. If you believe that is true, select B. Or they affect women and men in relatively equal percentages of the population. And that answer is C. I'll give you a few minutes to, a few moments to select your answer. 
It looks like everybody has chosen C, and that, that, is, that is correct. Um, so we're going to delve in and specifically talk about two, two different types of, of GI malignancies. First, pancreas cancer, and then we'll get into um, liver cancers as well. I find it very um, helpful when going through um, these presentations to think about the organs that we're dealing with and kind of talk about what, they, what their baseline function is. So here we're looking at a pancreas. Pancreas is located in the upper abdomen. Um, you can see the gallbladder is right there. Um, it sits right underneath the liver. It's intricately involved with the first part of the small intestines called the duodenum. Um, it's an organ that's about 6 to 10 inches long, and it has two primary jobs. Number one, it secretes hormones into the blood to regulate blood sugar, as well as other hormones, but the big ones being insulin and glucagon. This is known as the endocrine pancreas. And its second biggest job is to excrete enzymes into the GI tract that aid into the, in the digestion of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Specifically, the enzymes they produce are amylase, protease, and lipase. This is known as the exocrine pancreas. So big take-home points from this slide are endocrine function, so management of blood glucoses, and exocrine function, digestion of food. Um, pancreatic cancer, it, the most common type of pancreas cancer is pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. You will see it abbreviated as PDAC in some literature and furthermore in this slide. Um, and that is cancer of the exocrine pancreas. PDAC is the third most common cause of cancer-related deaths, and it surpass, it's projected to surpass colorectal cancer and cancer-related deaths by 2020. So if you remember a couple of slides back where pancreas cancer uh, or colorectal cancer deaths were number two, um, it's so, you know, expected to switch in the next year or two. Um, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma overall, all stages, so regardless of what stage at diagnosis, um, the five-year survival is a dismal 7.7%. In cancer, we define um, survival in, in five years. Risk factors for pancreas cancer are a history of cigarette smoking, alcohol use, any history of pancreatitis, um, and history of diabetes. As you remember, one of the biggest jobs is, is management um, of or regulation of blood sugars. Presenting symptoms. Um, obstructive jaundice, um, I'm going to flip back a couple of slides here, so to the, the picture right there, and you can see the, the bile ducts flowing through the pancreas and joining with the pancreatic ducts there and, and emptying into the small intestine. So our, many patients, about 50%, will present with what we call obstructive jaundice, and that's when the bile duct becomes compressed by a tumor, and it prevents the flow of bile from the liver and the gallbladder into the small intestines like it normally should go. Um, and that's when patients get the characteristic um, yellowing and itchy skin. Um, weight loss is another big presenting factor. Abdominal pain, frequently it radiates to the back right between the shoulder blades. That's characteristic of pancreatic um, abdominal pain. Um, and a recent new diagnosis of type 2 diabetes in a patient that's never uh, necessarily had any, any issues with management of their blood sugars. For workup and staging at all, it, you know, each, each patient's path to, to these diagnostic studies is very different. Um, so, you know, if somebody presents to an emergency room with abdominal pain, they might start with a with an um, CT scan where we see a mass. If somebody presents with, um, you know, a bunch of you know, issues eating or having issues tolerating food, they may um, have an upper endoscopy first. But regardless. Um, we would need a pancreatic protocol CT scan, also including the chest. When we say pancreatic protocol CT scan, what we mean by that is a CT scan that has specific fine cuts at the area um, where the pancreas is so we can get really, really great pictures of what the pancreas looks like, what the pancreas tumors look like, and most specifically in relationship to the vasculature that surrounds the pancreas. These CT scans or MRIs will allow us to evaluate, like I said, the tumor relationship to surrounding vasculature, which becomes very important when we're making treatment discussions or decisions. Um, it will look at the lymph nodes in the neighborhood to evaluate whether or not the cancer may or may not have spread to those lymph nodes. And it will also evaluate for distant metastases 
um, metastases, meaning spread of the cancer from the primary loca tumor location to other places. Common sites of metastasis for pancreas cancer are the liver, the peritoneum, which is the lining of the abdominal cavity, and the lungs. The lungs is why it's important for us to include the chest on our CT scans. Um, here you'll see a picture of a pancreas tumor. That darker area where the yellow arrow is pointing is the pancreas tumor. Um, the blue hashtag is the superior mesenteric vein. Um, and that, the red asterisk to the right of the blue hashtag is the superior mesenteric artery. Um, what we're looking for in this, in this picture or in these scans is simply, does the mass involve those blood vessels? Um, it's clearly, it's away from the artery, so it does not involve the artery in this case. Um, and it does abut the, um, the superior mesenteric vein right there. You can see just a little bit um, of touching of that, of that vein to the side of the tumor there. Um, further workup in staging, an endoscopic ultrasound. Um, is simply an upper um, GI where they, they go down the throat with an endoscope um, and they can evaluate with an ultrasound the pancreas through the wall of the stomach. That um, imaging study can also evaluate the tumor size and location and relationship to the nearby vasculature as well as the nearby lymph nodes to determine if they are involved. What the endoscopic ultrasound can do that the um, CT scans or MRIs cannot do is they can actually take a biopsy of that tumor or the lymph nodes to send off to the pathology so that they can look at it under their microscope and determine what exactly this mass is. Is it cancer or is it something else? Another thing that I didn't mention on here, because it's not necessarily um, pertinent to all workup and staging for pancreas cancer, but um, GI procedures can also do something called an ERCP um, where they intervene in in those patients that, I, that we discussed with 50% of them presenting with obstructive jaundice or tumor blockage of the bile duct, an ERCP will allow the gastroenterologist to intervene and place a stent into that bile duct to hold it open um, against the tumor compression so the bile can flow freely um, into the, to the bowel. So the patient's um, bile can flow, they can eat a little bit or digest their food a little bit better and they're also not quite as at risk for some infections. Tumor markers in pancreas cancer, um, we look at a, a tumor marker called CA199. It's not necessarily sensitive or specific for pancreas cancers, but we do trend it. So we do check it um, on all patients. Not all patients are positive. Um, and we're not, you know, we don't know exactly what to do with it if it's positive, but it is a trend that we look at. Um, over the course of, of treating this patient in their disease history and care. Um, one thing you'll notice um, that we didn't talk about with pancreas cancer is screening. There is no current screening available for pancreas cancer. It is all symptom driven um, at this point in time. Uh, it's one of the reasons that with all GI malignancies that, that the, the mortality rates can be higher is because the, a lot of the symptoms are pretty insidious and they're generalized and so disease tends to spread by the time that we have found, found um, any definitive diagnosis at times. Um, this is a, a look at how we stage pancreas cancer that we use the TNM classification system. This is um, produced by the American Joint Committee on Cancer, the AJCC. Um, and essentially what that looks at, it, it's different for each type of cancer, but it looks at the tumor size, um, so that's the T. It looks at regional lymph node involvement, and that's the N. And M is distant metastases. So there's a different chart just like this for each cancer, but this one is the, the specific um, staging chart for, for pancreas cancer. Um, and so various treatments before we kind of get in, into how we treat pancreas cancer. Surgery, is, it's, um, we consider this a local therapy. It only works where we can remove tumor and reconstruct, um, either reconstruct the, the GI system or where we can take out parts of organs and, and, you know, live with the part that we have remaining, for example, in the liver, which we'll get to later. 
Radiation is just use of, of x-rays to kill cancer cells. It's also considered a local treatment. It works in small defined areas. And then chemotherapy um, or systemic therapy are medications that can be given either IV or orally, um, and they travel through the body to, to treat cancer cells all over. So when we're thinking in the big scheme of treatment of cancer, the spread of cancer throughout the body or localized cancer in the body kind of frames how we think about what treatments we, we need to use on this patient. So for example, a patient that has a newly diagnosed pancreas cancer, even if it's newly diagnosed, if it has spread elsewhere or metastasized somewhere, most of the time, almost all of the time, surgery and radiation are not necessarily the, you know, the, the primary um, point of treatment. Um, so here's a little bit more in-depth picture of the pancreas anatomy. Most specifically, what I, what I want to look at here is the blood vessels. You can see a really good image of the, the blood vessels, the major vessels that are involved in the, in the pancreas. Um, and that's, those are those blood vessels that I was talking about on the CT scan that we're looking at. We're looking at tumor relationship um, to the superior mesenteric artery, to the celiac axis, which are all arteries that supply a large portion of blood, oxygenated blood, to the GI tract. Um, and then the superior mesenteric vein and the portal vein, which empties a lot of the blood from the GI tract back toward, to the liver. To the left, um, you will see a chart, um, and this is the medical group of the College of, um, Medical College of Wisconsin uses, um, but it's a fairly standard chart on how we determine whether a pancreas cancer is resectable, meaning surgical surgically appropriate for an operation, um, if it's borderline resectable, which means it may need some optimization before surgery would be helpful, or locally advanced, which means also the same that would need some optimization before surgery may be attempted. Metastatic, as you can see at the bottom, um, shows that there's evidence of distant metastases. Um, really what we're looking for is, like I said, the relationship to, of the tumor to these, these large um, vessels in the pancreas. On the whole, if you're looking at this patient um, on a CT scan, um, what we're looking for is that if that tumor is on the right side of these blood vessels, it determines which operation they have. So if it's on the right side, we would recommend a pancreaticoduodenectomy or a Whipple. If it's on the left side of those um, blood vessels, we would do what we call a distal pancreatectomy and splenectomy. We'll talk about those just a little bit more here. So in summary, we get the CT scans or the MRIs and we find that we have a resectable pancreas cancer. We will proceed with surgery. Um, if our patients are incredibly high risk, uh, meaning we may have some, some concerns that there's some metastatic disease um, or they have other risk factors, we would maybe recommend chemotherapy first. Um, if they're borderline resectable or locally advanced, we would recommend chemotherapy, um, followed by a reassessment for resectability, so repeat imaging. Um, and then we would decide, do they go back to chemotherapy for more chemotherapy, possibly some, chem some radiation, or are they now surgically appropriate? And again, if they're metastatic, meaning they have tumor evidence of, of metastases elsewhere, um, they would just be on a palliative chemotherapy. So again, if the tumor is to the right of those blood vessels, we would recommend a pancreaticoduodenectomy or a Whipple. Um, this picture is a really good picture of exactly what's removed in a Whipple. It's a very large operation where we remove the um, distal or far part of the stomach, the gallbladder, the first portion of the small intestines, and the head of the pancreas. And then we have to reconnect all of these things to reestablish GI continuity. So there's a new connection called an anastomosis between the pancreas and the small bowel, the bile ducts from the liver into the small bowel, and then the stomach to the small bowel. For a distal pancreatectomy and splenectomy, a um, little bit of an easier operation, and that's where we take the far portion of the pancreas plus the spleen, and that's just because of the intricate um, association with the blood vessels there. So surgical interventions, um, anytime we're assessing our patients for, for surgical, 
um, intervention, what we're looking for is, are they nutritionally appropriate for surgery? Are, is there anything that we can do to better optimize their nutrition before surgery? Um, because this will certainly help in recovery. Um, again, most of these, many of these patients have um, newly diagnosed diabetes. So are, is their diabetes under control or is there anything we can do to optimize them from that perspective? Um, again, it will help with wound healing and recovery as well as obvious optimization of medical comorbidity. So if someone has severe cardiac issues or respiratory issues, it's certainly going to make it difficult to, to undergo such a large surgery and recover from that um, efficiently. For both of these operations, um, we're looking at a hospital day somewhere in the 5 to 10 day range. Sometimes it's a little higher than that, maybe even 5 to 14 days. Um, the Whipple operation is generally more on the 7 to 10 day side, whereas the uh, distal pancreatectomy and splenectomy is closer to the 5 to 7 day um, expectation. Overall, it takes about 12 to 16 weeks for these patients to feel um, that they've somewhat recovered, almost 100% recovered, and many of these patients um, are going to undergo chemotherapy um, after surgery, which may make that recovery even up to we tell our patients oftentimes nine months to a year before they feel like they're even close to 100%. Um, biggest risks of either of these operations on the pancreas are what we call a pancreatic leak, where the pancreatic duct leaks the pancreatic enzymes that the, pancreas, that the pancreas produces into the abdomen. Um, gastroparesis, the stomach is just kind of stunned after this surgery and the stomach just doesn't empty very well. Um, so gastroparesis literally means paralysis of the, of the stomach. And exocrine pancreatic insufficiency is where the pancreas, because we've removed part of it, now doesn't produce enough of those enzymes to help in digestion of, of food. Um, so that's why we see the postoperative nutritional deficits. Many of these patients already had weight loss coming into these surgeries. They weren't eating well to begin with, and now we've removed part of one of their organs that helps them digest food and rerouted their GI tract if we've done the Whipple, and that really creates some nutritional deficits. Um, with any operation, and especially looking at that 5 to 10 day hospital stay, these patients really develop some endurance deficits where they're really truly only able to do you know, a little bit of activity at any given time. So we really push them to do more and more. And that's why up front, any of these patients coming in, we certainly recommend that they're doing some cardiovascular work um, at home, even if that's just walking 20 to 30 minutes a day. Chemotherapy and radiation for pancreas cancer, um, it's certainly an integral part of, of their care. Um, recommended chemotherapy for resectable, borderline resectable, or locally advanced pancreatic cancer is, is essentially six months of chemotherapy, which is given every other week. Um, the reason we recommend that is because we know that 80 to 90 percent of patients who even have a curative surgical resection will develop a recurrence that's not at the pancreas. It is elsewhere in the body or metastasized elsewhere. This, there are several different regimens that an oncologist can choose. Um, that's largely based on each individual patient's, their medical comorbidities, their functional status at the time, and the tolerance of each individual regimen. Um, so there's two different, two different ways we think about chemotherapy and radiation. We think about it in the neoadjuvant sense, and that's before, before uh, surgery, where you know, those locally advanced or borderline resectable cancers aren't quite ready for surgery. We would recommend chemotherapy and or radiation first. This does require a definitive tissue diagnosis before a medical oncologist would be giving any chemotherapy, which means they would have to have a biopsy-proven pancreas cancer. Um, the benefits of this are that it would allow for tumor downstaging and improved surgical resection margins. It also allows time for some you know, pretty clinically progressive or occult disease to be identified, and it may spare an unnecessary operation. And what that really means, it sounds harsh, but if a patient has a biologically aggressive pancreas cancer, if they're giving, getting six months of chemotherapy in that six months, if they develop sites of metastasis, they likely would have been those patients that recurred quite quickly after their surgery. And if we haven't operated yet, then we've spared them such a large operation plus a recovery um, when we probably would not have changed the, the trajectory of their disease process. 
If chemotherapy and radiation follows surgery, we call that adjuvant chemotherapy or adjuvant radiation. Um, and the reasons why we advocate against this uh, most of the time in pancreas cancer now is because up to 50% of patients who go to surgery first will not successfully finish their chemotherapy due to all of those complications that we've already discussed on the previous slide. It also does not allow for possible tumor downstaging prior to surgery. So once we've gotten a patient through their six months of chemotherapy plus their surgery, um, plus or minus radiation, they fall into a surveillance category. The surveillance is they would see an oncologist or a surgical oncologist every three to six months for two years, and then maybe every six to 12 months from then on for until five years, as, as clinically indicated. During those surveillance visits, we would be doing an entire history and physical to see if they're having any symptoms of recurrence, any symptoms or sequelae of the treatment that they've already undergone. We would check that CA199, the tumor marker, again to trend it. Um, and that we would have periodic CT scans or MRIs of the abdomen and pelvis, as well as the chest. If that CA199 level is surprisingly elevated at one of those visits that was not with a CT scan, we would, it would prompt a, um, a CT scan at that point. Here are the survival curves um, over, over the 60 months or the five-year interval, and this is all stages of pancreas cancer. Um, the one with the best survival is the resectable pancreas cancers. You get about close to a 20% um, five-year survival of a resectable pancreas cancer. Um, and you can see that the metastatic pancreas cancer, um, most of our, our patients have passed away within the, within the first year. All right. So here's a poll everywhere question. A patient has a tumor that is abutting the portal vein um, of the pancreas. Which of the following treatment plans do you think we would be recommending? A, surgical intervention, B, chemotherapy, C, radiation, or D, chemotherapy and radiation? Um, exactly. Um, so 100% of folks so far have, have put in that they would recommend chemotherapy and radiation. And that's exactly what we would recommend. And that's, that's to make sure that the, the tumor is coming off of that uh, portal vein to help us clear surgical margins. Um, now, the radiation is kind of plus or minus on that one. The C chemotherapy is a definite. Um, radiation, if we had close margins at the time of surgery, we would recommend some radiation. Um, or if on imaging studies after completion of chemotherapy, it still looked like that um, portal vein was involved, we, we would quite possibly consider some preoperative radiation as well. All right, so here's, here's a case study. Um, recently, we had a patient who's a 56-year-old African-American male. He had newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes. Otherwise, he was in his usual state of health, had no significant medical problems other than this new diagnosis of diabetes. He was relatively active and had no physical limitations. Um, so his, you know, his primary care physician was treating him for this new, new diabetes. And then all of a sudden, a month later, he developed a painless jaundice and puritis. Um, bilirubin levels are elevated in, with jaundice, um, and that's what causes the puritis, which is just the, the global itching. Um, their skin just itches all over. He was referred to his local gastroenterologist who completed some lab workups and did a liver biopsy that didn't really show anything. And so an additional two months after development of this, um, the patient was admitted to UNC, and his bilirubin level was three times the upper limit of normal. And so the bilirubin level is what was causing the painless jaundice. Um, he got a CT scan on admission to UNC, showed a, um, a three and a half centimeter mass in his pancreatic head, which was compressing the biliary ducts. Which, and causing upstream dilation of the biliary system as well as the pancreatic duct, um, and that was all from obstruction of the secondary to the tumor. His mass abutted the portal vein, and there was no um, enlarged lymph nodes noted on the CT scan. We had our gastroenterologist complete an endoscopic ultrasound that confirmed a three centimeter mass in the pancreatic head, also with biliary obstruction, abutment of the portal vein, they biopsied the mass at that time, 
and they did an ERCP and placed a metal stent to alleviate the, the biliary obstruction. His biopsy results revealed pancreatic adenocarcinoma or pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, PDAC. His CT of his chest was completed for final staging and showed no evidence of metastatic disease in the chest. His CA199 was normal. Um, his tumor was deemed borderline resectable due to the abutment of the portal vein, and he was referred to medical oncology for chemotherapy. He had interval CT scans after cycle 4, cycle 7, and cycle 12 of chemotherapy, which revealed a stable mass in the head of the pancreas, but with continued abutment of the portal vein. He was deemed appropriate for surgery, so we took him to the operating room for surgical resection four weeks after his last chemo treatment. His mass was in the pancreatic head, so to the right of those blood vessels, so he had a Whipple. His postoperative course was uneventful, and he was discharged home on postoperative day 6. His final pathology revealed a YPT1CN1 um, pancreatic adenocarcinoma, and he had positive margins. So the YP is just nomenclature for us to see that he's already had treatment prior to his surgery. That's what the Y means. P is pathologic staging, meaning that's the sample that was removed during surgery. Um, and positive margins means that the edges of the specimen that was removed during surgery did have cancer all the way to the edges. His pathology results were reviewed at UNC's um, weekly GI multidisciplinary tumor board, and recommendations for this patient um, were to undergo further radiation therapy due to the positive margins. He was then referred to radiation oncology as recommended and is currently completing a course of radiation therapy. After completion of that, he will begin a surveillance program, um, including you know, every three months, if not more frequent, history and physicals, labs, and CT scans. So next we're going to talk about liver cancer. Um, so here's a picture of the liver. Um, big things to kind of note on the liver is we can certainly live without, you know, a pretty good size of our liver, um, but we do have to make sure if we're removing part of it that there's enough liver left and that the liver has appropriate blood flow to, appropriate blood flow away, and that it has appropriate biliary drainage after a surgical intervention. So the liver does, does a lot of things. It's located in the right upper quadrant of the abdomen. It produces bile, which aids, aids in the digestion of fats and removes waste from the liver, um, excreting it into the intestines and ultimately to, into feces. It produces proteins found in plasma, produces cholesterol, storage, stores excess glucose, and creates um, glucose when the body doesn't have enough. That's called gluconeogenesis. It regulates protein levels and protein metabolism. It processes hemoglobin and stores iron, filters blood of toxins, um, regulates blood clotting, and it clears bilirubin uh, via the bile, which is what we were just discussing in, in the last case study. Hepatos, there are several different types of liver, liver cancer. Um, you can have cancers of the biliary tree within the liver. You can have metastases of cancers to the liver. Um, but what we're going to talk about today, specifically hepatocellular carcinoma, um, or cancer of the liver cells themselves. This is the fifth most common cause of cancer in the world, third most common cause of cancer-related deaths worldwide. Um, in the U.S. specifically, rates of hepatocellular carcinoma are rising. Um, incidence has tripled in the U.S. since 1970. The five-year survival rate for all stages of HCC is only 16%. 90% of HCC develops in the setting of liver cirrhosis. So when we talk about risk factors for HCC, essentially the risk factors are cirrhosis and the causes of cirrhosis. Um, hepatitis B being the most common cause of hepatocellular carcinoma in the world. Hepatitis C is the most common cause of HCC in the Western world. Um, alcoholic cirrhosis. Um, one of the reasons that we're seeing such a big increase um, in HCC is thought to be in part due to this you know, relatively new diagnosis of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis um, in the U.S. But other um, risk factors are metabolic disorders um, that you can see the examples of there, hemochromatosis, Wilson's disease, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Um, unlike pancreas cancer, there are screening um, guidelines for HCC. 
The purpose of a cancer screening test is to identify the presence of specific cancer in an asymptomatic individual in a situation where early detection has the potential to favorably impact patient outcomes. So screening for HCC is recommended for those patients with cirrhosis that are caused by essentially anything, hepatitis B and C, alcoholic cirrhosis, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or fatty liver disease, and primary biliary cholangitis. These are the um, National Conference of Cancer Network guidelines for hepatocellular carcinoma screening. It's essentially, if you look at the left of this flow sheet, um, for patients at risk for HCC, this is the group that they recommend receive the screening, and it's essentially the, the ones that we just read out. Um, at the very bottom, you'll notice that the NCCN guidelines do recommend that hepatitis B carriers, even without cirrhosis, fall into a screening um, program. Screening for this is completed with an ultrasound and um, a blood draw for alpha fetal, um, protein AFP is the tumor marker for HCC that we look for. Um, and you can see to the right, this is um, the, the flow chart of what we do if an AFP or an ultrasound is positive. It sends the patient into an additional workup. If we see a nodule less than 10 millimeters, they, we repeat these studies in three to six months. And if it's negative, um, we repeat again the ultrasound and the AFP levels um, six months. Um, if we found an ultrasound or an AFP is positive, this is, this is what our decision-making tree looks like. Um, we then move forward with a CT scan or an MRI. Um, many HCCs can be diagnosed by imaging studies alone, um, but if the imaging studies do not confirm or make a conclusive definite, um, decision for us, um, we will biopsy those. Um, presenting symptoms. Many can be asymptomatic, and that's why a screening program is, is important, especially for those at risk. Um, but if patients do present with symptoms, it's typically upper abdominal pain or discomfort, a palpable or a, an upper abdominal mass that the patient or a clinician can feel, unintended weight loss, ascites, or fluid collection in the abdomen, and about less than 5% of patients may present with a tumor rupture. Workup and staging is, is collection of the alpha fetoprotein, like we were just discussing. It's a tumor marker. It's increased in 50 to 90% of patients with hepatocellular carcinoma, but also not sensitive or specific, so it's not diagnostic, but it is something to trend. Imaging studies, like I said, can be diagnostic with HCC. A CT scan or an MRI will have certain characteristics that can that can certainly diagnose an HCC without a tissue diagnosis. An ultrasound can certainly see things, but it does have a false negative rate of 50%. And again, if, if any of the imaging studies are equivocal, um, we do recommend a tissue diagnosis with a biopsy. Here's a CT scan with an image of um, hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, and it's that darkened, kind of lobulated looking area there on the liver. Um, and those, the, the lighter kind of lines you see going through the liver are the, the blood vessels. This is just the TNM staging for hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, so if HCC is confirmed, we do have to assess the patient and the patient's liver um, for surgical intervention. Um, uh, one of the treatments is either surgical resection of the, this, the liver with the tumor or potential for transplantation. Um, what we need to work up in either case is the history and physical for each patient, um, a hepatitis panel and other liver studies, um, including their protein levels, their clotting factors, um, or clotting ability with their PT and INR. Um, and we also need to assess if this cancer is spread every, elsewhere with a chest CT. Um, when, like I said, we can resect the liver. We do have to make sure the remaining liver is going to be appropriate size and functionality. So the child's pew class A and B um, are, are based on lab values and clinical assessment of patients with liver failure to help us understand um, the extent of their liver failure and if they would be surgical um, candidates. Um, so adequate liver reserve and suitable liver remnant is the big part there. Essentially, we want to make sure that if the patient has a healthy liver, that we leave no less than 20% of their liver volume. Um, and if they are cirrhotic, we're shooting for about 40%. Um, 
how do we determine if they're operable or inoperable if they are otherwise medically suitable for an operation? It's all about tumor location. And if we can leave um, blood flow to the liver, blood flow away from the liver, and biliary drainage from the liver, and leave them with a suitable amount of liver based on their other liver comorbidities. Surgical considerations are similar to that of the pancreas cancers, is nutrition, um, preoperative nutrition status, and optimization of other comorbidities, such as the cardiac and respiratory diseases. Post-op, you're looking at about a five to seven day hospital stay for these patients, and a 12 to 16 week post-op recovery. Post-op endurance deficits are a big thing, especially as the liver is regenerating and they're recovering from surgery. The liver does regenerate quickly, um, and we will see a significant improvement in the course of days to weeks even in the size of these patients' liver. Surgical risks for um, hepatectomy or partial hepatectomy, are, which is removal of the liver or parts of the liver, um, is bleeding, infections, and liver failure. And then they would also fall into surveillance after completion of, of a hepatectomy or partial hepatectomy, I'm sorry. Imaging is every three to six months for two years and then spaces to six to 12 months after that, similar to the pancreas protocols. Um, alpha feta protein levels are drawn every three to six months for two years and then spaced to six to 12 months. Um, and then would fall into another pathway if disease recurrence or metastasis is noted. Um, we would also certainly make sure that a hepatologist is involved, um, especially if they were carriers of hepatitis B or hepatitis C for treatment of the underlying viral um, disease. Here's a poll everywhere question. A patient with liver cancer has HCC. The cancer is resectable. What percentage of the original liver mass should be left in place for a healthy patient? Ooh, I'm sorry. Um, looks like everybody has chosen 20%, uh, which is correct. Here's our case study for our hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, we recently had a 57-year-old female presented to the emergency department with new sudden onset right upper quadrant abdominal pain that had begun about a day prior to her presentation. Her only medical history was obesity, high blood pressure, and, and high cholesterol. All labs were within normal limits. She had a CT scan that demonstrated a large left hepatic mass. Imaging favored a benign hepatic lesion. The patient was admitted just because of um, the concern for bleeding into the tumor, and we monitored serial hemoglobin levels um, to make sure she wasn't um, having any issues of further bleeding. Um, while she was in the hospital, we sent hepatitis serologies for hepatitis A, B, and C. They were all negative for underlying hepatitis. We obtained um, an alpha feta protein level that was elevated, a CA199. This was mostly, like we said, mostly used in pancreas cancer and cancer of the biliary tracts. Um, but again, because we can have masses of the biliary tract that occur in the, um, in the liver, we sent that tumor marker. It was negative. CEA is a tumor marker we use for colon cancer, but again, we can have metastases or spread of colon cancers to the liver, so we sent that tumor marker, and it was also negative. She was discharged on hospital day two with an improvement in pain, and her, stable, um, her hemoglobin had remained stable throughout the rest of the hospitalization. Follow-up as an outpatient or further workup as an outpatient included an upper endoscopy and colonoscopy to rule out any possibility of upper or lower GI cancers with a metastasis to her liver. This was negative. Um, and then we ultimately got a percutaneous biopsy of her liver mass. That biopsy proved to be hepatocellular carcinoma. Preoperative imaging was reviewed in detail and patient was determined to have a resectable tumor based on the hepatic vascular anatomy and the amount of future liver that would be remaining. Um, she was not a candidate for liver transplant based on the size of her tumor. So she was readmitted to the hospital and had a left hepatectomy um, several weeks after presentation with her initial symptoms. Postoperatively, she did great. She was discharged home on post-op day five. Her final pathology revealed hepatocellular carcinoma with negative margins. She's currently recovering from surgery and doing very, very well. All right. Let's go ahead and I'm just going to advance this a few slides so that we can get to our Q&A poll. So uh, I think we, the A was probably just from a previous poll. So uh, please go ahead and, and send in your questions. Again, you can either, if you're using the texting method, you may go ahead and text those in. If you're uh, just responding to the questions at poll lab, 
facebook.com forward slash UNCCN. Just go ahead and type them in there. Um, yeah, I think these are all coming in from a previous poll because I, I don't think the question is in. Um, so I've got several, uh, but I don't want to monopolize our guests. So, so I hope that, that you all have questions that you send in. So uh, first and foremost, uh, 80% of the liver, I mean, I know the liver is a big organ, but have, removing 80% mm -hmm. of that, what, what is the impact on, on a patient's lifestyle uh, given that that, up, that that significant amount of the organs can be removed? Generally, it's just post-op recovery. Okay. Um, and as the liver is regenerating, you certainly have, you know, we, we push a lot of protein on patients to mm -hmm. try to just get them to have their, help their bodies heal uh -huh. Uh -huh. and have the, the building blocks for nutrition. To rebuild that pro or to rebuild that liver. Right. Otherwise, it's fairly self-limiting. With oh. all of these large abdominal surgeries, mm -hmm. once these patients are home, those endurance deficits are real. Uh -huh. um, we push them to walk several times a day in the hospital. Right. But we're doing great if we can have them walk around the floor, which is okay. maybe 500 feet three times a day. Okay. So it's really just pushing nutrition and, and exercise at home. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Um, you mentioned in um, in the when, with the pancreatic cancer with the upper endoscopy and uh, being able to do a biopsy. So, so is the, uh, the the clinician performing the upper endoscopy actually going through the wall of the small intestine in order to do that biopsy? Is that how that works? Exactly. Um, okay. They can either go through the walls of the duodenum, which is mm -hmm. the first portion of the small intestine, mm -hmm. or through the walls of the stomach. Okay. Okay. Great. And back to pancreatic cancer also, mm -hmm. what, what is it that, that makes this disease so lethal? And we hear a lot about that, and we hear about uh, people of notoriety have had this and, and not had very long survival rates right. either. Is it, is it more about the recurrence of the disease once treated or about the, the metastatic effects? Yeah, pancreas cancer is, is something that is it's just an aggressive biological Mm -hmm. biologically aggressive cancer uh -huh. and we're learning more and more about that and how to treat that more aggressively and that's why in the last few years we have gone to trying to treat most of these up front with chemotherapy because we do believe that this is overall more of a systemic disease than uh -huh. a local issue gotcha. most of the recurrences I think the slide was I think the statistic is 80 to 90 percent of recurrences mm -hmm. are not mm -hmm. local recurrences so they're not mm -hmm. at the pancreas it's right. a metastasis elsewhere right. Um, and I see one of the questions here is, what are some standard regimens for pancreas cancer? Um, there's there's a couple different regimens that we use, um, and I'm, I apologize, I don't know very much about these because I focus in surgical oncology, but there's about three, three-ish regimens that the medical oncologists use, um, and they are given every other week. Um, they are anywhere from one medication to up to three medications. Um, and the way they determine which medication regimen is suitable for each patient depends on how functional that patient is okay. and how much their body can, can withstand. Mm -hmm. We all, in treating this aggressively, would hope that every patient can undergo that three-drug regimen, mm -hmm. but when you get these, you know, 80-some-year-old patients with very little functional reserve left, mm -hmm. sometimes that's just not, not possible. These medications all have side effects to them, and so even some of our younger patients cannot tolerate these three, three drug regimens that are quite quite difficult to tolerate and to take. So, and what does that decision making for the clinicians look like in practice? So, so you would start by prescribing all three of the medications, and then you'd be carefully monitoring side mm -hmm. effects. Mm -hmm. What what mm -hmm. might happen next? Um, it depends on the comfort of the clinician mm -hmm. uh, prescribing. Um, and the functional status and okay. comorbidities of the patient. Okay. So let's say a young, healthy patient and young, I uh, would consider, you know, 60s, 70s, sometimes young, if that's, mm -hmm. if that is the presentation from the other medical comorbidities, no other issues. Um, the, the clinician may start with the three drug regimen. Mm -hmm. And if the patient doesn't tolerate that, then they mm -hmm. might go to the two drug regimen. Okay. Um, Sometimes we do the opposite. Sometimes they'll start with the two-drug regimen, and mm -hmm. then if they tolerate that reasonably well, they'll escalate and do the three-drug regimen, gotcha. um, or they'll go backwards. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have just a couple of minutes left for questions. If, if you have any others that you'd like to ask, um, let's see. 
So you mentioned tumor markers. So for our audience, those tumor markers, those are always discovered through blood, mark, through blood work, is yes. that correct? Yes. Okay, okay. And um, so some tumor markers are closely associated with certain types of cancer mm -hmm. and others, as you mentioned, with pancreatic cancer. Uh, the fact that it's there may or may not be an indicator for that type of cancer. Correct. Okay. Um, let's see. I, I had a question about surveillance as well. So when, when you're talking about, uh, let's say, I'll just throw out a number, 65% five-year survival rate, does that factor in the, the surveillance as a part of that? So if somebody, would, would somebody be, would, would getting all of those surveillance steps, having those surveillance steps be part of that survival rate then? Uh, so I think what you're asking is, does the does the biological aggressiveness of each cancer impact our our decisions on how we surveil? Yeah, our patients? yeah, and and, and I guess does, does it, so if if somebody opted, let's say somebody had a 65 percent five year survival mm -hmm. rate, but she or he did not utilize the the surveillance mm -hmm. and and did not keep up with the mm -hmm. surveillance, would that negatively impact that survival rate so that that survival okay. rate might go down because the surveillance sure. wasn't being done within that five year period? So what we hope to accomplish uh -huh. with any surveillance program uh -huh. is catching either metastasis or recurrence mm -hmm. quicker. Right. Um, it's essentially a, it's a screening, if right. you will. You know, we talked about pancreas cancer doesn't have any screening, but then right. once you've been diagnosed with pancreas cancer, we look at the surveillance as ongoing sure, screening for sure. recurrence. So does it impact overall survival? If we mm -hmm. catch a cancer or a recurrence or metastasis sooner, it certainly right. could, and that's that's okay. why we do that. And I, I, and I, I guess I, I, I'm just thinking, too, that it, it must be extremely important to get the patients on board with maintaining this, this surveillance in order, in order to, to really have that chance Correct. of survival. Correct, absolutely. Okay, great, thank you. Well, let's take a look at um, just a couple of things before we close. Please, please, please go ahead and uh, take just a couple of minutes to go to unccn.org forward slash eval, E-V-A-L. I'll leave that up for a moment. And uh, so you can jot that down and go there and fill out this survey. We really rely on those. Uh, we also rely on getting the word out. So I would ask everyone watching today, you know, spread the word, tell somebody you know, tell a couple of people you know about this series, whether they're watching it live, and we'll have new uh, lectures coming out in the fall, whether they're watching it on YouTube, whether they're watching it in our library, or actually getting a certificate of participation by going to learn.uncn.org and watching on our learning portal. Uh, a few, we, we do have our new, uh, for the next year, our, our new lectures already lined up. We don't have the dates selected yet, but those will come out this summer. Uh, radiation Oncology in the fall, Caring for the Patient with Breast Cancer in the fall, Caring for the Patient with Lung Cancer, and Oncology Nutrition in the spring. And I, I forgive me, there's a typo there. It says spring 2019, but that'll actually be spring 2020. Uh, you can go to unccn.org forward slash events to find out about all of the different lectures, not only in this series, but in our other series. Uh, we hope that you'll visit our, our learning portal, learn.unccn.org, and there you can go ahead and find lots of community college lectures. Uh, and in about a month, this one will be up there as well. Uh, most recent ones added in this series are caring for the patient with melanoma or other skin cancers and caring for the patient with head and neck cancers. And there are uh, several others as well. So if you were an instructor, uh, we encourage you to look at that and think about using these for your class. And if you're a student, we encourage you to go ahead and, and look at those. Uh, let's see, what else? I want to thank all of the uh, people behind the scenes making this work, Dr. John Powell um, and Veneranda Obore and Mary King for all the hard work that they do. We want to thank uh, the UCRF and the state legislature for their generous support of this program, the Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. And thank you. We really appreciate you being here. Uh, if you have any questions, follow up, just get a hold of us, unccn.org or 919-445-1000. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in the fall. Thank you again.